I mean, you're right though, but <laughs> never marry. <laughs> Listen, never marry I'm the not stripper. talking. About, I'm not talking about marrying her. I'm just saying she's hot. She's easy on the eyes. <laughs> She's easy in a lot of ways. Yeah, she's very easy in other ways. You're right. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to Anime Club After Dark, the podcast that delves into all things anime, manga, and otaku quotes related. I'm your host, Alex, but you can call me Senpai. And joining me tonight, I just have our czar of source material, John. I wasn't prepared. I was reading something. What? <laughs> It's time to start, John. Oh, it's time God, to okay. start. All right. <laughs> but hey, John, you know what it's time for, don't you? It's time to duel. No, well, maybe, but it's time to talk about Peak Isekai again. <laughs> oh my God! Yeah. Yes. Uh, the second half of the second season of Mishoku Tensei has finally ended. Um, and we are going to talk about it. We are uh, going to sp spoil each and everything possible that we can about this uh, this half of the season, the second core of the second season. Um, before we get into it, two things I want to point out. Uh, first of all, uh, if you like what you see, uh, please give this video a like. It really helps us out. Comment down below about some of your favorite stuff about this uh, half of the season. Also, subscribe if you want to see more. Um and also, uh, something else I want to point out before we get into this, um, for most of our spoiler casts that we do, we typically only spoil stuff from the anime that we're talking about. However, since John has a lot of knowledge about the source material for this particular anime, uh, we may also spoil stuff from the source that isn't in the anime. So, you know, full disclosure on that. Um, now... Uh, for sake of clarification, I don't think John has actually read the light novel. He's only read the web novel. Correct. And the, I believe the light novel is like 26 volumes versus the web novel, which was like 21. So they, yeah. they did change. Um, the core of the story is still the same, but apparently they changed some minor things. And I'm just like, oh, so maybe I guess I should go read the light novel now. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe uh but yeah i just i wanted everyone to be to be aware of that um simply because for most of our spoiler cast we only talk about spoilers from the anime so we may also spoil stuff from the source material in this particular one which you know for fair in fairness we've done that for all of the mishoku tensei spoiler cast we've done since you've been on all of them i do believe um but anyway let's get into it john um it's still studio bind it still looks and sounds really good. Um, that I, I will say there were parts in this particular half season where the animation was like really good, especially the Hydra fight during the at the end there. Yeah, because uh, in this season there's only like a handful of action sequences. There's specifically like three. Um, first volume, or rather, I guess volume eleven. Uh, there's a fight scene, volume 12 and volume 10. Yeah, each of the volumes has, like, a fight, uh, technically speaking. <laughs> yeah. But the be the best one is at the the end, yeah. Yeah, and we'll get to it eventually. Um, this uh, particular season, or this half season, was directed by uh, Hiroki Hirano at Studio Bind. Um, he also directed the first half of the second season. Um, the music, which I actually really liked a lot of the music that I heard in this in this particular core, um, is Yoshiaki Fujisawa uh, in charge of composing it. Um, I do want to talk about the OP and the technically two EDs that we got in this, in this core. Um, the OP is On the Front Line by Hitorie which uh, you have some knowledge about them. Uh, I wouldn't say I have knowledge, just it was created More than by I do. a... <laughs> it was a band of four members uh, with the lead singer being someone I knew um, and liked their music quite a lot. And it was Wawaka. He, he made a lot of Vocaloid music. Uh, and I believe Hitorie is pretty famous because they also did a, I believe, a Boruto ED or OP or something uh polaris that's like yes. the famous one yes but yeah uh well waka passed away back in 2019 um and Unfortunate. i remember they had just previously released their album 
like four months prior to Wawaka passing. And the last time I knew, which was like five years ago now, uh, Hitotie didn't know if they were going to continue without Wawaka because he was the lead singer and, you know, he, he's also the writer and one of the guitarists. So uh, they were just like, well, we don't know. But uh, it's good to see that they decided to stick it out. Um, I definitely didn't know it was Hitotie because you know, obviously it sounds a lot Wawaka different. wasn't singing anymore. So it's yeah. like I didn't recognize the voice. What did you think but, of the OP itself? Uh, visually, I thought it was all right. Um, the song itself was also really like pretty good, but mm. I wouldn't say it was something that I I watched. Um, because <laughs> not it, an unskippable OP. <laughs> well, because for Mishoko Tensei, I I, I want to watch the story unfold. I, I the music itself is like all right, but it wasn't anything mm. like um Windbreaker where I was just like, oh god, I fucking <laughs> I love this song so much. I need to keep watching this this OP every time it comes on. Man, such or a like, um, such a like hit out of nowhere for I think both of us last season. <laughs> bro i i the hype was real like i i believe you know on the chart when it's like windbreaker was like rank three and people's expectations for like the best of the season i was like what the fuck is this windbreaker like they fart or something like what, what is this <laughs> you know he who breaks wind <laughs> i mean you know if you think about it a lot of shonen are like that who can produce the biggest landscape reducing fart is the winner <laughs> yeah but uh yeah there was like so I think it was that in Chilling in Another World where uh, Rie Kugamiya does the OP. I fucking love that OP. Just because I do love you, Rie Kugamiya. I was going to say, it. do you love the OP because it's good or do you love it because it's Rie Kugamiya? Because it's good and also it's Rie Kugamiya. Okay. So. Okay. Listen, uh, it's I liked so it. cute. I, I, I like the OP for what it was. A lot of the same for how you why you liked it. But I just, man, I got so used to it in the first season, the OP being like, completely non-existent like there's the visuals are the opening to the episode yeah i'm like can we go back to that please because that was actually unique and cool well there was an op song in the beginning um yeah but it was just that <laughs> they're like we can't even waste a minute of time there's so much information we need to put inside of each episode so th that was cool of them but uh, um so yeah, I'm good. I'm good. I had a little indigestion there. Uh, <laughs> uh, so we technically got two EDs uh, for this half season. Um, for the most part, for most of the episodes, the ED was uh, Mamoritai Mono by Yukio Ohara, um, which I thought was pretty good mm -hmm. as like your typical chill ED. Okay, I, I just... You said Mamori Mamo... Itai. It's like, no, that's not how you pronounce that at all. Mamo Mamori Itai. No, Mamori Itai. Whatever. I, no no Japanese here. No mm. understand, though. <laughs> Bro, you got to be Josie. What are you going to do next year when we go to Japan? What the fuck? No. No bueno. <laughs> <laughs> Just speak Spanish. Yeah, that'll yeah. work out. <laughs> Entiendas Espanol? <laughs> When you speak Spanish, the subtitles will come out in Japanese for them. So it's fine yes, to that's exactly how that works. That's exactly how that works. Uh, but yeah, I thought this was like your typical chill ED that you see. I mean, there was nothing special, but the song was nice. That's all I got to say about that, really. Um, and then in episode three of this half season, we got the ED Subasa, which was sung by Nanahoshi's voice actress, which I thought that was actually pretty good. Uh, I really liked the ED this season, but like I said, I the OP and ED are kind of just like whatever. <laughs> like they're good. It's not what you're. It's not what wrong. you're here for. <laughs> yeah, like I don't. I don't watch Mushoku Tensei because I'm like, oh my god, the sound design. You know, like friggin' yeah. Um, oh my god, what's his name? I I don't know, John. You tell me. Sawano. <laughs> oh, here Yuki Sawano. Yeah. I, it, the soundtrack is great, but it's not like Suwano levels of like, oh no. my god, it it, no. it it changes the feeling of the entire freaking show when you listen to the Suwano. No, the thing with Hiroyuki Suwano is he can elevate a mediocre anime to good by his music alone. I would disagree. Recreators was pretty god awful, even with Suwano doing the soundtrack. Okay, but the problem with Recreators is it was god awful. You can only do so much with god awful. <laughs> Um, should we actually get into the story? Uh, this oh, yeah. Season? Uh, so, so I, I, the, apparently John looked this up for me. Apparently there are 
like distinct arcs, multiple arcs throughout this half season. I actually only collated all the episodes into three different arcs. I called it the domestic arc, the labyrinth arc, and the picking up the pieces arc. But apparently yeah. there's like four or five different arcs this half season in the novels. No, there's only uh three. It's volume ten, volume eleven, volume twelve. So mm. let's see. I don't even know what they call it. They call it the everyday or no, not that oh that's the next arc. Uh the oh, newlywed oh. arc, the sister arc, and the labyrinth arc. Those are the three arcs mm. that this season covers, uh, in the light novel. Uh but it would be technically four four different arcs if you use the web novel, I believe. Mm. Hold on, okay. let me I gotta read. Oh, he's he's he's, he's looking it up. Jamie, look that up. Oh no, it's three arcs still. Never mind. I was thinking of something okay. else. Awesome. Um, so I like it. so this basically picks up pretty much right where the first half of the season left off. Um, and you know Rudy and Sylphie are back together, and he talks about wanting to get you know wanting to marry her and all that stuff. So the first thing he does is he needs to buy a house. So, John, what does he do? He buys a fucking haunted house. Because <laughs> it was cheap, bro. This man is a businessman. He understands property values. <laughs> well, Listen, all I'm like... saying is if you want a cheap house, find one where someone has committed suicide. It's not that he committed sewer slide. It's <laughs> or, uh, the people who live there committed sewer slide. It was that the people who live there kept dying and they didn't. No one knew why. So they're like, oh, shit, people keep dying when they live here. So in uh, Rudy's so elated to, like, finally meet Sylphie again and to, like, you know, have his manhood back. Uh, mm -hmm. And he, he's, like, he's not walking on cloud nine. So he obviously knows and thinks that, like, oh, I owe so much to Sylphie that, like, I, I have to show an expression of love for her. And it's like, okay, well, I need to buy a place that's not too far from the university. It needs to have enough space. And he wants to, you know, he wants to give her – uh, a dowry that's worthy of her, right? Of her value, mm -hmm. which is why he chooses this giant fucking house. Not only <laughs> is it cheap, it's also a freaking giant house. Uh, the caveat is that it might be haunted. <laughs> yeah, but I like, like how Cliff gonna... Cliff's Cliff's reaction upon seeing it is like, "This is a little big for two people, isn't it?" <laughs> I mean, it is. Like, it's something that they don't talk about in the uh, anime. Like I said, like it, in most and um anime adaptations they trim the fat right like yeah it's not important that we learn that rudy was elated about you know sylphie and so he he went all out for this house because of that i will say we'll find out later in this season that they trimmed a lot of fat in certain places <laughs> i wouldn't say they trimmed a lot of fat they just trimmed uh things that i thought were important pertaining to that specific arc <laughs> Mm -hmm. Like, I, I always, in every single one of our spoiler casts, I always say this, like, man, this adaptation's really good, but fuck, did they leave out a bunch of stuff. <laughs> they leave out the yeah. context of so much things, and like I kept saying in the last previous spoiler cast, it's not that it was a core part of the story, but mm -hmm. they leave out a lot of background things and um, world-building things and character-building things, character development things that aren't necessarily important, but they play a role, in my opinion, of why i think the story is so good mm -hmm. and that's like my issue with the story in general i'm like oh god yeah this like you skipping this doesn't make this scene as impactful because you skipped it you know they've done that consistently throughout the last uh 36 episodes or whatever it is for the last since the beginning of season one part one yeah. season one part two and then season two part one yeah i think you've said the only stuff they de didn't really trim anything off of was like the first quarter of the first season you said that plays out almost exactly like it does in the novel yeah it's i mean they they better they fucking utilized all the space yeah um so when they go to this house they find the doll that's killing people and uh uh what's his name Z zanaba i can never remember his name the zanaba bull, yeah him the bull haircut guy he's the bull one that, that that stops the the doll i like how rudy when that doll like puts its hands under the, like the the roof like you can see it when he looks up rudy is mm -hmm. way too calm when that happens if that were me i'd be like oh hell oh, i'm getting the <laughs> fuck out of here i'd be i'd be exercising the secret joe star family technique immediately 
<laughs> well, you got to understand that prior to this, he was an adventurer. He was always teetering on life and death anyway when he was yeah. uh, Quagmire. Um, yeah. That was his nickname as the as an adventurer, Quagmire. <laughs> giggity, giggity. No, not that one. <laughs> no, I just, I saw that and I'm like, mm, if I were in this position. Mm, mm, yeah, I know. Mm, like, mm. <laughs> I can't <laughs> defeat this. I must run. <laughs> um, But then, you know... <sighs> That comes that comes about later, but we'll talk about it. The whole magic doll thing. Uh, so Rudy ends up fixing up the house a little bit, invites Sylphie over, formally proposes to her. Obviously, she accepts. Um, and then we have the wedding reception, right? Mm -hmm. That wedding reception was something else. First of all, we get my boy uh, Bodyguardi coming back. I love that man. Every time he's on screen, I'm like, <laughs> please give me more of this man, more. <laughs> Yeah, the Demon Lords are pretty wild. Like, they talk about it in the last season, or, or the last part of the first, of the first part of season two, uh, where it's like, yeah, when um, a Demon Lord lives for thousands of years, so they're, mm. when they say, yeah, I'll see you soon, soon could be like 50 years. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of, well, it's, it's like relative. free run. It's like free run. So they're, they're all, because they live so long, they're all very uh, free-spirited. Like, uh, mm. Badigadi's fiance, I, I don't remember her name, but the one that gives Rudy the uh, magic eye, mm -hmm. she's like, you know, that's they're all flippant like that. Because they live for so long, they're kind of just like, yeah, we, we do whatever. Yeah. Um, but at this wedding reception, we get a revelation that if you've been paying attention, you kind of may have suspected, but we get confirmation of it. John, John, what's her name? I want you to say her name. <laughs> Elena Lees. Yeah. It's a good effort. Elena Lees. Ella, Elena Lees. <laughs> Ele, Elena Lee. I can't say her name. I hate. No, it. we get, we get the revelation that Elena Lees is Sylphie's grandmother. Which, yeah. if you've been paying attention throughout the first and second season, you might have gotten a hint of it. Because the um, the little medallion or necklace or whatever it is that Sylphie gives to, to Rudy looks a lot like the one that Ellen Lees has. Well, actually, uh, in the get first backwards? season... Ellen Lees gives to Rudy. So tries Ellen, to Rudy. Well, no. She, she gives her medallion to uh, her kid. And <clears throat> her kid gives it to their kid. And their kid turned out to be Sylphie. Uh, and she gave it to Rudy. So when mm. he first when he first meets uh, Ellie, I'm gonna call her Ellie because I can't pronounce her fucking name. <laughs> she like looks at the medallion on his chest, like where'd you get that? And That's he's right, like, yeah. oh, uh, my friend from uh, this village gave it to me. And she's just like, huh? All right then. And then nothing comes of it. And it's like that was the the little peak that Teaser. like there, she it, and everyone forgot about it i, I forgot about I, it i did not forget about it because i thought they did not they did not focus on this they did not have a close-up of this fucking medallion in this anime for no goddamn reason they are not gonna check off's gun this shit so they i believe sylphie explains it like it's a a good luck charm for elves so mm. I think a lot of people would just assume, like, oh, it's just a charm from elves, so whoever has this, uh, another elf could see it and be like, oh, this person is a friend of elves, so they can be yeah. trusted or something. That's what I assumed uh, it probably was. I Again, it's been over 10 years. I I, got, I can't remember that much. Not 10 years. It's been, like, <laughs> maybe 7 or 8, but it's been a while since I've read uh, Mushoku Tensei, and I really should reread it. You should read the I light novel the just light to see novel. how different it is. Just to, just to compare and contrast. But yeah, that revelation that Ellen Lee's is Sylphie's grandmother, that was it was pretty cool. Um I like how that was handled. Yeah. Uh it's like I mean, it's cool now Sylphie's not alone anymore because we know her yeah. parents are dead. Yeah, unfortunately. Um but Yeah, I, I like how like it's treated very as it would be kind of emotionally, I think. Like it feels very real. The way that that whole revelation goes down, where they're both very emotional about the whole thing, and they have to have a talk about it afterwards, and it's like, yeah, I could see something like that happening in real life. And there's even more to it because, like, for uh, Sophie's grandma, she she abandons her ch child because it's like he would have a better life without me around. <clears throat> yeah. 
So she, because she's now like, all right, I'm going to go around and be an adventurer and try to break this curse or whatever. Uh, she doesn't know what happens to her son. And the fact that, like, she's, oh, my, oh my God, I have a, a granddaughter. Like, he must be doing all right. And it's like, oh, but he's also dead, though. Yeah. Which is sad. But it's yeah. not it's not anything that they, anyone can really do. I mean, the teleportation event happened, and it, it fucked over a lot of people. It did. And... Uh, but it's also uh, it's it's more of a bittersweet meeting because it's like, you know, Sylphie finally meets up with Rudy again, and now she um she's like she has a connection to Rudy and gonna get married, and also she also has family again. She has a grandma that she never knew about, and she can learn more things about like her elf side. Because Sylphie Sylphie's only a quarter elf at this point because her her dad was the half elf, I believe. Pretty sure it was her dad that was a half elf. I don't remember. <laughs> but she's not a full blooded elf. No, but uh, because she is, she does have some elf blood in her. She's going to look young for a long time, but I believe she, as a quarter elf, she'll probably age the same amount as, like, a human. Okay. okay. She'll just look more youthful. Okay. Um, so, <laughs> after all this happens, um, we have probably one, the, the first episode in this half season that really struck me and it's the whole thing with nanahoshi right so when we meet nanahoshi first of all i love this character because in so many isekai like it's always treated as going to the other world is a good thing it's always a positive thing and largely for the the main character it usually is portrayed as that right yeah but nanahoshi doesn't want to be there she wants to go back to her old life and so she's doing everything in her power to to try and make that happen, and she keeps failing over and over and over again. Um, and when she has that massive like summoning circle experiment that goes wrong and it fails, it's something that she'd worked on for I, I forget how long they say like four months, five months, something like that, long time. Um, and it fails. She becomes completely despondent, like she spirals into like absolute major depression. To the point where well, I like, is this going to become? The, is this going to become her make unalive arc? <laughs> so one thing that um, Nanahoshi talked about is that she, because she's an otherworlder, she doesn't actually have mana. Mm -hmm. And she was like, I was trying to do. She's trying to do whatever she can to try to get back to the other world, but without mana, she can't do anything to test the circles. And the circles, summoning circles, take so much mana to like operate that it's basically impossible for her to like achieve her dreams so she was kind of at her wits end but then when she finally meets Rudy again and she realizes like oh my god he has he's an otherworlder but because he reincarnated here he actually has mana yeah he wasn't summoned he reincarnated so now it's like she's finally seeing um you know a light at the end of her tunnel of despair mm. so it's like okay as long as I can focus on this but then as it turns out like her summoning circle uh it keeps failing like it's not just like yeah. it failed once. It's like no, it keeps failing. Yeah, but and she doesn't know exactly why. It. Yeah, because you know she's she's just a high school girl. Uh, she tries. She's because she's a high school girl, and unlike most isekai anime, she doesn't get any OP abilities. <laughs> like she infinite really mana. Doesn't really get much in the way of abilities at all, except her wits. Yeah, it's like everything that she has is due to just her being um. Just being her, like her learning by herself, like learning the language, uh, learning the summoning circles and like all that stuff, deciphering all the scripts that she did mm -hmm. by herself. It's not like she had any magical tool or anything like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, that that whole like little mini arc there with her, I absolutely adored that because it just no, not many isekai bother to show a character getting summoned or reincarnated or whatever into a new world and absolutely hating it. Yeah. Uh, it's, I think it's very rare for, cause most of the time the Isekai is a story trope genre trope that people like because it's an escape from reality. Like I'm going to go to a fantasy. different or, or, or both. It's a power fantasy. Yeah. And okay, an yeah it can be both. Reality. Yeah. A lot of people like, I like reading Isekai because I think the fights are pretty fun. And I, I like mm -hmm. to see, like, what kind of bullshit are you going to come up with to try to survive in another world? Yeah. But, like, 
so many people that get like reincarnated, like main characters in isekai stories. They're people who are they're losers. They don't have a lot going for them in the the world that they came from, like our world, or they're <laughs> hi, shut hi, in. They're a neat, huh? <laughs> I said, hi, hi, Cosmo Des. <laughs> yeah, hi, Cosmo Des. Uh, they're a shut-in. They're a neat. They're a gamer. Uh, very few of them in the other world are, like, super well-adjusted and have really good lives. And it turns out that Nana Hoshi actually had a life that she enjoyed, and she was yeah, ripped she was from a it. Fr- <laughs> she's a freaking normie. She's just a normal high school girl. Yeah. Uh, and so she doesn't want to be there. She actually wants to go back to the life where she was loved and she understood people and she had people around And they her had running toilets her. and they had electricity yeah. and the internet. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like a lot of a lot of East Sky stories don't mention how, like, you know, going into a medieval fantasy setting, even though you have magic, Would be a, a lot of the shock. settings... Well, a lot of the setting, you still don't get, like, running hot water, flushing toilets, refrigeration, yeah. for fuck's sake. Yeah, ice. Yeah. <laughs> ice cubes well, in your drink. They they sometimes supplement, like, magic for, like, ice and stuff like that. They'll, they'll use magic as a supplement to that I setting because it's like, well, there's no there's no need for an innovation when you can just use magic to cure it. Right, like, true. What's the point in learning how to do surgery when I can just cast cure and now you're yeah. not gonna die? What's the <laughs> like, point in learning how to do sutures when I can just cast a healing spell and your skin is automatically regenerated? Right. <laughs> um, but no, I, I love this just because the character of Nanahoshi is something that I think is sorely missing in the isekai genre. People that don't want to be in the world they get transported to. Yeah, I'd, I'd um, say it's pretty rare for an isekai to have main or any kind of characters like that. Um, I can think of maybe like three or four different isekai manga that I've read where the characters are, their end goal is to get home. Yeah. Um, so that's great. And I do love this arc, the like the, the resolution of it, where Rudy uses the power of friendship to solve the problem with the summoning circle. Because the summoning circle <laughs> is not meant to like because she wants to do this in stages she wants to like see if she can bring something from the other world into their world and then just gradually move up to more and more stuff until she can eventually maybe send herself up um so this yeah. particular summoning circle was trying to bring something inorganic from the their world back into this world yeah so uh rudy realizes that it, as as we all know rudy's not that smart um, no. he's hailed as a genius because of the fact that he can use chantless magic and he it's has like insane reason. mana it's reserves, an- right? It's another reason I love this story so much because it portrays Rudy, the main character as being powerful, but not infallible and definitely not immortal. Um, fuck. I don't know if I can talk about this or not. It might be a spoiler. All right, I'm not going to talk about it. If it's it. for something beyond this, don't talk about it. <laughs> it is. It is, but it has to do with, like, why... It's, anyway, point is, it's, like, he has, like, insane mana reserves, and he can do chantless magic, sure, but dude is still stupid as fuck. He's, like, a yeah. normal dude. You know, he, he was jobless in the real world anyway. It's not like he learned any specialty yeah. skills. And he didn't have he much of an education learn. in the real world yeah. either. But he's like, oh, but you know what? I have friends who are fucking geniuses in their own right. Like, Zenoba has a shit ton of um, super strength, and maybe he knows something because he's royalty. You know, he has yeah. connections, right? Uh, Cliff is also, like, he's the transfer student who's mega smart. Like, he's the reason he's in the specialty class is because he always scores the highest. So Cliff is, like, an insane guy to ask. So, and he also pretty... knows a lot about, like, magical, like, talismans and stuff, too. Well, I mean, he's I doing research on he's doing like um, artifact research, but yeah, he's yeah, very knowledgeable. Arti- he's Chris, like an artificer. Uh, uh, yeah, Cliff is very uh, knowledgeable. Mm-hmm. So Rudy uses the power of friendship to be like, "Hey, I know that this doesn't make any sense. Like, I know I can't do it, but is there anything you guys can think of? Like, just outside yeah. of the box thinking, which I really like because that's something that I believe, um, like, is something that a smart person should consider is that sometimes people who may not be a specialist in your field still Mm. might have a point of view that you can view that you can utilize to view it from yeah or some kind of knowledge that you didn't consider yeah Uh, it's just something that you should always be open to uh that's part of like to be be a truly open-minded person that's something you should always be thinking about like maybe 
like this idea sounds dumb, but you, I try to understand when I hear dumb ideas, like what is their intention behind this? Like what, what is their logic behind it? And then you try to reverse that logic and then like, okay, how can I apply it to what I'm doing? Like, and then it, it just helps you build the base blocks of like how to connect things to build something yeah. to get to what you want to do, like to problem yeah. solve. I, I do also like how the solution to this, because they kind of sort of make an attempt to explain how summoning circles and teleportation circles work. They're like basically magical circuit boards. Um, and the experiment they're doing just causes the summoning circle to short circuit, quote unquote. Uh, so the, the solution they come up with is like layered summoning circles. It's like simple, but brilliant. <laughs> Well, because Layers different summoning in, circles on top of each other. As far as they know, in this world of magic, like when you make summoning circles, like runes and stuff, it can't be too complex because there's only so much mana that the rune can hold. Well, summoning magic requires a lot of precise things to calculate. So just like a computer, you know, you need a lot more yeah. RAM, you need a fucking graphics card, you need a CPU. So you need more energy when they realize uh when they're talking and they they realize like Zenoba's like hey i know i can't contribute much but remember the doll that we captured that i've been looking at like it has how how is it moving and being automated for so long and it's like oh yeah that's right it it has more than one function it's not just a mechanical doll it's a doll that can fucking stalk and kill and it's moving for like it's been moving around for the last like 30 50 years or whatever it and was and it's moving autonomously 10 years yeah, so it's like, okay, it's very complicated. So they take a look at the the doll, and they're like, oh, my God, they have stacked. Like, they have so many runes that are complex, but it's because they're stacked. And it's like, oh, my God, we've been thinking about runes in a 2D space because we think about paper. But what if we applied it with a 3D space where we stack them on top of each other? Mm -hmm. And it's just like, oh, my God, I just invented Brilliant. arrays <laughs> in coding. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> Functions and arrays that we can just code like that. It's fine. I feel like this is also like when when uh, when Newton discovered calculus. He's like, "Oh my God, I could do this!" Did he discover calculus? I thought he invented calculus because he couldn't explain math well, or some shit. Yeah, he invented it, but invent discover. There's a debate as to whether math is invented or discovered. <laughs> I mean, math has always been there, so it technically, would be yeah. discovered. But anyway, that's not, that's not the point. The The summoning circle is the point. And they bring a water bottle from the real world, a plastic water bottle from the real world into their world. And everyone that isn't Rudy or Nanahoshi is fascinated by it. Yeah, because for Rudy and Nanahoshi, you know, a pet bottle is a... It's just a fucking plastic bottle, like whatever. But for them, like, of course it's insane because the only thing that they know that's clear is glass. And even yeah. then, glass is still cloudy because of, like, refinement problems and stuff like that. Yeah. At, it, this is clear, and also, it's super light. It's like, what the fuck? It's super light? What, and you what can is squeeze this? it. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. It's a, I mean, if you took a polyurethane bottle like that, and you went back fucking 100 years from right now, and you show them, like, yeah, this is the future. We can put stuff in here. They'll be like, mm. dude, what the fuck? <laughs> like you can carry so much water with that and it doesn't like it's not mega heavy like that's crazy yeah technology is grand sometimes <laughs> and with Mishoko Tensei I believe it's supposed to be like in the freaking middle ages or something so mm. yeah um but yeah I, I love that little arc with Nanahoshi so much um and the the little celebration they have at the end not a character growth for, for Nanahoshi in those two episodes um, it's great. Um, at the end of this though, uh, Rudy receives a letter from Paul, uh, talking about trying to rescue his mother Zenith. And, uh, part of this letter says that, uh, to keep his sisters or yeah, I guess sisters, uh, I was going to say half sister, but I guess Aisha technically is a half sister. Um, but he's got, uh, it's going to send Aisha and Norn, uh, to live with Rudy. Uh, to keep them safe and uh my boy rougerd is back as well because he uh, escorts them there i love that man too he's almost like body Gotti. every time he's in a scene i'm like yes give me more <laughs> i loved his character in season one man i don't 
I don't think they're ever gonna like go into the story of Rugerid and the Supard race because mm. I I remember reading about that um in the novel at least like the the tragic backstory they might go into it when they talk about like the demon lords later on and like why Laughless is a piece of shit <laughs> but I, I want to say so much about Rugerid like about his story and why it's so tragic you but can, maybe they'll you go can into tell it me later. after we're done recording. <laughs> Yeah, I'll tell you after we're done. Because I, I actually don't remember when they discussed that. But yeah, uh, Re- Re- Jared is taking Rudy's advice about like, what if we went around and spread your name, is like uh, cleared your name as a, a supard by doing quests that make you, put you in a better light. Like his, mm-hmm. like, this is from all the way from season one when he meets Re- Jared, the supard, about like, how do we reclassify uh, this race of demons that everyone is afraid of because of what they did in the last great demon war where they were tricked by lapless to go fucking murder everyone. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Um, I, I hope they go get around to talking about that more in detail in the anime. I suspect they might not. Unfortunately. I, Um, I don't remember when they do talk about like Rue Jared's past and stuff like that. And the Supard race in general, and mm-hmm. what Lapless did during that demon war. Yeah. So I can tell you after we're done recording, but yeah, I, I won't mention it here just cause like, yeah. I'm pretty, maybe they'll talk about it like in season four or something. Maybe, <laughs> maybe, or maybe they'll There's just a... never talk about it. <laughs> or if they never do, I'll, I'll, if I remember, I'll talk about it and be like, Oh my God, they, they totally missed out on this and it's actually super cool. But uh-huh. yeah, Ruggiero's back. Uh, and he, he took Rudy's advice about like, you know, do stuff that makes you, not look like a murderer and it's like well i I will be the guardian of children then children will be my charge and i will deliver them safely and it's like he's this is the way like this is the mandalorian right here this yeah he's literally the mandalorian um but now they the uh bring aisha and norn to live with him um i like the dichotomy between those two characters too because one of them is like i won't say in love with rudy but like really respects him and the other one's like I don't know about you, man. <laughs> yeah, so... Norn is so distrustful of him. And you gotta understand that with how Norn and Aisha were raised, like, Norn wasn't raised by uh, Zenith because of the teleportation, right? Yeah. And there's actually more stuff that... There's a different arc in the next season that they'd go into, so you learn more about, like, Norn and why she's like this. But, uh, I again, I'm not gonna spoil that, but... Uh, as far as she knows, Norn, her only interaction uh, with Rudy was that she came back t- to the tavern to see some guy beating the shit out of her dad. Yeah. Like, that was her only interaction with that guy. And she's like, that's my only family. Versus Aisha, she still had her mom. And her mom was always like, oh, we are, you know, I'm I'm the second or I'm, I'm the concubine. I'm not an official wife. Like, technically, I guess it's she was the second wife but she because she's the uh concubine wife it's like oh we serve this family and we should be grateful to be serving this family and uh aisha's mom actually does talk a lot about rudy and is like you know he seems odd but he is a very great guy like he's a very um smart guy and able to like things that are creepy that you know a five-year-old kid shouldn't be able to do he's able to do (laughs) Like yeah. magic, um, but now both of the uh, the sisters end up taking like the the university entrance exam or whatever it's called. Um, I should just makes gets a perfect score, and Rudy's like, "All right, you don't got to go to school. You're already too smart. They're not going to teach you anything." And then Norn does not so good, and so uh, she ends up going to school. Uh, but she wants to live in the dorms, right? on uh on campus and that kicks off another great uh little mini arc in this half season that whole thing with norn uh like rudy gets a little like window into what he was like because she starts to become a shut-in when she go when she goes to school and she gets to the point where she doesn't leave her dorm room doesn't even leave her bed um i don't know exactly how long that was supposed to be going on for but it, it's implied that it was like for at least a couple of weeks I think it was like right? two weeks or something. Um, yeah. I don't remember the time frame, but yeah. Then Rudy goes like all fucking John Wick. He's like, "Who the fuck's bullying my sister?" <laughs> yeah, he <laughs> pours into like, that class. It's in process. It's like, "All right, tell me who it is now." <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, he scares the shit out of that class. And then one 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 little girl raises her hands like, I think I know something, and he just glares and is like, Tell me how! <laughs> Gives a fucking Batman on him. And as it turns out, it's like, oh, she's not actually being bullied by anyone. Because, you know, he thinks like, oh, she's being a neat because just like him when he was um in the real world, he was being bullied a lot. And that's why mm-hmm. he became a neat. And he's like, someone's bullying her. And as it turns out, no one was bullying her. It was the expectations of her. Uh, Garrett, being against related her, to Rudy. Yeah, being related to Rudy, the super fucking, the, the, the number one strongest magician at this academy. <laughs> who like this uber yeah this uber mage who knows so much about magic can literally do chantless magic uh talks to royalty like it's nothing <laughs> and is yeah. a well-renowned uh adventurer she's living in his shadow yeah and she's like she's super depressed by it because everyone expects her to be like him and she's not so another thing that they uh they did not mention was like so Norn spent her entire life being told by Paul who has to raise her after the tel- teleportation event like you have an older brother his name is Rudy and this guy is he's so smart um he's like you're so great and Norn doesn't understand why Rudy is so great because again the only thing she knows is like well he's violent cuz he beat the shit out of my dad even though Paul was like, you know, that's you shouldn't blame Rudy for that. Things happen, but we talked it out, and we're fine now. We actually, you know, we're on good terms. But Norton still doesn't understand that. And so she, in her entire life, she's always being told, yeah, your big brother Rudy is good. He's great. He's amazing. Uh, Aisha and her mom are always like, oh, yeah, Master Rudy. He's, he's or Aisha's mom, rather. It's like, yeah, Master Rudy, he's great. He's amazing. He's super smart. He's an amazing magician. So her being inundated by her own family about this mysterious older brother that she's never met who or rather only met once and it was like this is he's a violent guy she now has to live in his shadow that's why she was afraid of him because it's like i i don't know this guy and it's like she's she's feeling a lot of pressure to live with this guy that she only has memory of one memory of and it wasn't a good memory now Which, she's my in... god if you were if you were living in that kind of a shadow and then you were like blindsided by the fact that you know, she takes that exam and she doesn't do very good on it. Like you're nowhere yeah. near his level. That big be depressed too. Well, not only that, like, so in her own life growing up, she's being told that Rudy is so great. Now she goes to the academy, and she's it's it's happening still. Everyone yeah. around her is like, oh my god, you're you're Rudy's sister. You must be so smart. Then you must be just like him, and this and that. And it's like, yeah. no, she's just a normal girl. Yeah. Um, I, I love that. Well, I, I'll tell you, visually, there's something I really loved during that, um, that arc. So there's that scene where Rudy goes to her dorm room and he knocks on the door and he's, you know, like, can I come in? And then he opens the door and inside is his room from the real world and he sees himself. Yeah. Uh, that they, was so good. That Visually, that's so good. Because, you know, this is what I love about Mishoka Tensei, because it's all about, like, um, trying to redo his life and be better, be a better person. To grow. And this is one of the things that he confronts. Like, now now he can see from his older brother's perspective of, like, how he was. Yeah. And he's, like, trying to learn how to communicate with someone. It's like, I've been in their position, but at the same time, it's like, how do you communicate properly to them without like them lashing back like cuz Rudy's like my heart can't wouldn't be able to stand it if if Norn acted like me. He's a complete yeah. fucking selfish degenerate. Yeah. I and I love the fact that we get that flashback with his brother trying to like talk him out of it. It's like, "Hey, you know, let's we, you don't even we don't even have to do let's just leave the house just for a little bit." And it's yeah. like he's just completely ignoring him. And it's like now he sees it from the people around him's perspective. And it's it's great. It's fucking yeah. great. Or why Man. I love Mushoku Tensei. Like he, <laughs> like regardless of how perverted Rudy is, he's always tried his best to be a better person. Which is the shame of this show because so many people only look at it through that surface. Like Rudy's a pervert. Like yeah, yeah he is. But if you get past that for like five minutes, you'll see that he's like trying to do better. Yeah, and it's not like he's a pervert all the time. Like, sure, when he was a kid, he was, but in the like in season two, for example, who among us when we were kids weren't? 
Yeah, I know. Like, but uh, yeah, it's just a shame that a lot of people only see the surface level of Mishoko Tensei, which is like, oh, he's some preferred kid who's super OP, and it's like, yeah, he's OP, but he's also not like super smart. He's not. Well, the only thing he has at his disposal is that he can do chantless magic, and he has an amazing reserve of mana. That's it. That's the that's the only that's, difference. Yeah. I had man, I just I wish I wish more people would give this a chance and not just look at it at service level because you get shit like this. You get him like not just being introspective about what he was like in his old life, which is another thing I don't think enough isekai do is like so many isekai once they re- reincarnate or get transported to the new world, their old life doesn't mean anything anymore to the story. In this one, you constantly get reminded of what his old life was like. Yeah, because it's He's trying to live a better life. He's trying to be a better yeah. person. Like, um, and we get to see the struggles of him trying to become a better person, which is why I, I've always is, really liked the show. It's it's real because, like, in the real world, trying to be better, trying to improve yourself, it's not easy. No, yeah. it's not easy at all, but it's worth it. Um, but yeah, then he he eventually gets through to Norn. Um, little by little um i don't think it was like a you know one conversation it's like magically fixed um it's it's gonna take time but I... well there was the the conversation where he's crying and he broke down he's like i'm norn i'm so sorry like i didn't know yeah. like this was happening to you and that's when it's like he's opening his heart to her and it's like they're having an actual heart to heart and they can actually like norn can finally actually communicate with rudy yeah um I, I just I like the fact that it, it doesn't seem like it just was magically fixed after that conversation. It's like you know one day at a time kind of stuff. Yeah, they slowly build it. Yeah, build up their relationship. And then once that our little arc is over, who oh boy, we get to turning point three. Here we go, John. <laughs> Listen, I loved going into the the Crunchyroll like comments on the videos. And, and seeing people's reaction to this episode, like people are starting to realize the man God might not be so good. It's like, where have you been? Where have you all <laughs> been this entire time? I would forgive you. I would forgive you for thinking the first time you saw him that he was kind of okay or whatever. And then the second time you should have your suspicions. But now there should well, be no doubt like, in your mind that he's a fucking evil dude. You don't know that he's evil. Um, He seems like he he's very flippant right he's kind of just like ah yeah it's whatever guy uh Mm. but every time he's given advice to rudy it's for rudy's benefit Mm. so allegedly (laughs) well you know every single thing he's told rudy has helped him you know being able to um, everything he said has come to pass yeah so it's like being able to survive the demon continent after the teleportation event he meets reed jared and it's like yeah he will protect you who shepherd you and he does uh, and then, like, oh, you want to cure your ED? Like, go to the academy. And he meets Sylphie, and he cures his ED. So it's like, you know, the man god hasn't lied yet. Yeah. And now he tells him that if you go try and save your mom and help your dad, you're going to regret it. Oh, yeah. You, you didn't. So uh, a new letter arrives from Paul. Oh, yeah. A new uh, Yeah. This one isn't written by Paul. It's written by Geese, isn't it? I think it's geese. No, I, I don't remember. No, yeah. no, no, no. It's the, Paul. All, it's I, Paul. I do know that all the letter says is the the rescue of Zenith does not go well. Send help. That's all the letter says. Yeah. So then, uh, Rudy has to like decide to go, uh, save his mom, or like not because like okay, he has a home life now. Uh, Sylphie's and it's pregnant. good. It's good. It's a good life. Yeah, like he's he's got a house, he's got a family, he's got a pregnant wife. He's like he he, he there's research on the teleportation circles going magnificently. It's like it's all up and up, you know. And then the letter arrives and it's like, "Oh shit, real shit." Uh and it's like he he doesn't want to go and you know, the man god then appears and is like, "Hey, what's up, man? I see that you're uh you have a dilemma here." And you know, he's like well, I need to go save my mom. And then the man God's like, mm, I wouldn't do that if I was you. Mm. It's like, why not? And he's like, well, I can't tell you, but I I will say if you go and save your mom, you will regret it. And yeah. then he's like, more than I would regret it if I stayed here. It's like, 
if I have to go or I have to stay, like, I'm going to regret it either way. It's like, yes, but I, if you go save your mom, there's going to be a bigger regret. And it's just like, well, why are you being so cryptic? And he's like, all right, bye. So then Rudy's <laughs> like, all right, well, the man God is a fucking asshole, but he hasn't led me astray yet. So I think I'm probably going to stay. You know, my wife's pregnant. My dad can uh, can probably uh, work it out. So then Norn, when she learns about like, hey, your mom is um, trapped and needs help, she tries to sneak out and she's just like, <laughs> <laughs> like, like Norn could do fucking anything, right? Like, I like how fuck? she gets to the last step and she tries to step down and she just falls over with the pack on her back. And, you know, Rudy comes out and it's like, all right, like, you can't sneak off. And it's like... I don't understand Big Brother, like, again, and this is part of why I was like, fuck, they skipped that whole, like, uh, Paul talking to Norn saying, and, like, there's an actual scene where she's, like, talking, uh, he's talking to Norn, explaining how Rudy is such a good guy, like, a, an amazing uh, magician and this and that, and he's so, he's so good, so great, and it's like, that leads into why Norn's pissed off, because, like, aren't you this, some, aren't you this amazing dude who has crazy amounts of magic who could do chantless magic things that's something that no one else in this world can do i guess sylphie can do it too um because he ta helped taught her how to do magic so but no one else knows how to do chantless magic so it's like you yeah. literally are the pinnacle of the university you're seen as the strongest fighter you are an amazing adventurer why aren't you using your abilities to go save mom like is yeah. what everyone's been telling me you're so fucking great but when push comes to shove you're a little fucking pussy so i'll go like I and then Norn's like I get it. You have a pregnant wife. You have a life here. But this is our family, and this is all I have. And it's just like, and that at that point, that's when Rudy gets like, okay, you know, fuck what the man God said. I'm gonna go. Then he has to have yeah. that discussion with Sylphie. And you know, again, I have always said Sylphie, uh, best girl. <laughs> and it's just like she understands. Like this is your family. You have to protect your family. She's she understands. Die. Yeah. It's oh God. I fucking love Sylphie so much. She's such. <laughs> such a good wife oh my god listen I, I been, i'm gonna say right now because from the first season i said maybe roxy best girl but i i have after after this season especially after this last half season sylvie definitely best girl i told everyone sylvie best girl and no one understands why and i've been saying that since the first like time we've <laughs> talked about sylvie you know like y'all don't even know why she best girl yet and you still saying, don't know why yet until we get to the end Sylphie is the Garrus of Mishoku Tensei, <laughs> to put it in Mass Effect terms. Um, but no, uh, also something that, that does happen, um, Rudy obviously tells Ellen Lee's what's what's happening, and she resolves to go and help Paul, right? Um, yeah. And she was going to go by herself. Um, and th the place they're going to is like, what would they say, like a, a year to a get year. there, it's another a, year to get year back? Away, yeah. Um, by the way, I've, I've wondered, is there anywhere online where there's actually like a world map? Because there's so many places that are like years apart from each other. It's like, how big is this world they're on? I wouldn't say that the world is big. It's just that they have to travel by foot, mm. by, by carriage and stuff. Like they don't have railway systems and they don't use magic or anything to like teleport or like fly or, fly. or anything like that. Because again, uh, magic like that would take so much mana and it's so complicated. Literally no one can do it. Yeah. And it just would be a waste. So I like I like how in this world magic is used more for practical purposes than fighting. <laughs> you oh, see like magic, magic is being so, used for practical stuff. Magic is so basic in this world of like I can control elements to use it to either burn you or freeze you or water. Or create you. water. <laughs> yeah, it's like yeah. it's not very useful. Hmm. Like it can be used for battle, but it's easier to make stuff for like practical everyday use. Well, like, for one thing, uh, like, Rudy, when he summons uh, his rock spikes, he actually was like, oh, if I add rotational force to these to these rock spikes, they'll penetrate. They'll go faster and they'll penetrate deeper and do more damage. That's something that he can do because, one, he has a fucking crazy amount of mana reserves. And, two, because he can uh, do that, he can use the wind element to help spin it. Yeah. Kind of like, um, you know, like a barrel to shoot yeah. it out faster. So, Because like most magicians are like... You know, most magicians can only they master one element and it's like oh i can master earth so i can throw mud at you or i can throw <laughs> rocks at you but that's kind of like the limit yeah. versus rudy it's like oh i can actually use fire wind water earth 
Um, I believe the one he can't use very well is he can't use healing very well. Yeah, they, they actually show that in this this arc where they're having that uh, him and Sylphie are doing the uh, they're trying to teach each other stuff, right? And he tries to do the healing magic and he can't do it anywhere near as well as she can. And for anyone who's a keen viewer, it seems like healing magic and the strength of your healing magic is proportional to how empathetic you are as a person. Yes. She mentions and that as well. It's like, I think maybe you can't heal this is because you can't empathize with the person you're healing. And Sylphie is an amazing healer. <laughs> Sylphie is an amazing healer because she's so empathetic. And it's like, mm -hmm. yeah, that's part of why she's best girl. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, the whole... Uh, the the end result of all this is both Rudy and Ellen Lee's uh, resolve to go to uh, this continent, the city on the other continent, and and try to save uh, his mom and help Paul out. Um, they do it with the help of teleportation circles that Nana uh, Nana Hoshi knows about. Yeah, so Rudy's going around saying his farewells, like, "Hey, I, I actually I had to go on this adventure to go save my mom, so uh, sorry I can't help you." And Nana Hoshi is like. He's like, oh, God, I got to tell her, like, I can't help you if you're uh, teleportation and stuff, your summoning circle stuff, because I got to go. And that's when she resolves to be like, all right, I wasn't going to tell you anything about this, but, you know, you've been a bro to me. You helped me with this, and I need you back here as soon as possible, so I guess I'll tell you about the summoning circle. And yeah. as it turns out, it's like, oh, she knows about summoning circle or teleportation circles because of Orsted. When she was traveling with Orsted, they used a bunch of teleportation circles. And yeah. she teaches them, like, here's the location of one that can get you close. Uh, this is how you access it. Yeah, instead so, of it taking a year, it only took, like, a month, I think. I think it only takes, like, a month instead, yeah. Yeah. So it takes 11 months off of their journey both ways? Yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. Uh, but, yeah. Uh, and so then that once they set off, that begins what, what I guess is referred to as the Labyrinth Arc. That's what I called it. Apparently, that's what it's called in the novels, too. Yeah. Um, and this is the part where uh, some stuff starts to get cut. So the first part of their journey, once they get to the, uh, once they use the first teleportation circle and actually get onto um, the continent that they're supposed to be on, um, they go through the desert, right? Yep. And you said that there's a lot in that journey through the desert that's cut out. Uh, there's a lot of contextual things. Uh, there's a lot of background things and a lot of world building things that they do cut out. But again, like Probably I said, a lot of dialogue between Rudy and Ellen Lee's as well. And it's not like majorly important. Like we learn like the whole uh, getting charmed by the, was it a succubus? I think it was or whatever in the desert. Yeah. So we learn the reason why like um, Ellen, Ellen, uh, Elise, Sylvie's grandma, Sylvie's grandma. We learn why she fucking hates Paul. Uh, we learn about like why Paul and, What's her name? I, I do not remember her name. Uh, Aisha's mom. Um, uh, Lilia. 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 Lilia, Lilia, I think, yeah. Lilia. Uh, we the learn, maid. like, why... <laughs> the maid. We learn why she even likes Paul in the first place because of, like, what happened. So one thing they discuss is, like, oh, for the succubus, when she charms you, you get seduced and you, like, try to have sex with the next thing you see. And mm. the only way to break them out of their charm, if you don't have someone who can, like, dispel charm is to either kill the succubus or have sex. So one thing that um, Paul does is I believe he's he has sex with Lilia? And that, like, fucks up the whole dynamic between the party because now it's like, okay, now Lilia, and now there's this whole love triangle between Paul, Lilia, and Zenith. And then, like, um, I don't remember why Ellen needs the Sylvie's grandma. Uh, <laughs> I don't remember if she also got attacked by him or something but anyway uh yeah they they explain stuff like that mm. they don't in the anime and they like i said like yeah it's not majorly important it's just little do, character stuff i do like i do like when they have that attack by the succubus and rudy is very clearly visibly horny um, <laughs> and at least just bogs him with the shield well yeah because now this is <laughs> Because, like, uh, it's, well, I mean, first and foremost, this is her granddaughter's husband. So it's like, you know, yeah, it's kind of gross. Yeah. <laughs> like, we all understand that she likes, she goes, she sleeps around, but, you know, she still has morals. Yeah. Uh, 
just that that thing with Rudy's like just one time, Elise, just one time, bonk. <laughs> oh my god. Um. Yeah. I. I. When I was watching this, I got the the um the sense that there was quite a bit in that journey through the desert that was probably cut out for time. Um, wish we could have seen more of it because like you said, it probably adds a little bit of context to some stuff that we see later. Um, but I mean, it's still good for what it is. Um, and then we get, uh, when they get to the city of Rapan, Rapan. Yeah. Is that how you say it? I think it's, I it's just Japan with an R. That's all I, um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and they uh, meet up with Paul and his little company of, of adventurers. Um, and that, that little reunion is nice. Uh, Paul actually seeing Rudy after all those years away. It's like, my, how you've grown. Yeah. <laughs> he's not a little kid anymore. I mean, I yeah, guess on he's top of that, he's like, kid. oh, also, like, I'm, you're going to be a grandpa. And he's like, what? Yeah. What? He's like, yeah. And he's like, yeah, I met Sylvia again. He's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's uh i mean it's a cute little reunion but at the same time it's like paul looks like he's you know he's dying he looks like he he's a shell of his former self because they've been attacking this labyrinth city um over and over again this, the labyrinth the teleportation dungeon i think they call it yeah. uh, over and over and they're just like they have no idea what they're doing and how they're going to get through it and you know, as it turns out, it's like, oh, actually, I have this book about this labyrinth, this specific dungeon, actually. Yeah. What a twist. <laughs> what a twist. So it's like, it's a good thing that Rudy prepared and talked to all those people who gave him all that knowledge, because now it's like he's ready to actually go and tackle the dungeon. So yeah. they set out on a um, exploration, but he also learns, like, also, like, where's Roxy? And it's like, oh, we lost Roxy. Roxy's and trapped he's just in like, there, too. Yo, what the fuck? <laughs> Yeah, and they're like, it's been like two weeks. Like we we haven't been able to get to her, and he's just like, "Well, Master Roxy is strong, so I'm sure she'll be fine until we get and to the, where she is." And that's also something that you said was was cut from the anime adaptation because in the novel we actually get to see, or at least hear, about um, Roxy's like exploits in that two week span. Yeah, so they cut out the part where Roxy. Uh, she's like well while she got teleported away how she actually survives uh and what her thought processes are while she's surviving uh the things that she has to do she eats the demons that are in the dungeon even though they taste like garbage because she needs to eat and she creates like water garbage. with water magic and you know she just like survives like that for two weeks on end and she thinks about rudy a lot and it's like you know i i don't want to pass away before i um find more students and see how far Rudy has gotten in his magic because he must be like, Oh, I don't remember what class it is. King it's like class? King, King class king is what she is. Yeah. She's a King class. It's like Rudy must be at least King, if not higher than me right now, like demigod yeah. class or whatever it is, uh, in terms of like magic. So yeah, that's something that we miss, which is unfortunate. Unfortunately. It, it give it gives a little more context to her reaction when she gets rescued. Yeah. Um, um so you know, they dive into the dungeon and eventually they get to the floor and, and then Paul like is trying to show off to Rudy because, you know, it's like, <laughs> oh, I, I can finally show off to my son because I'm I'm so cool, I'm a cool dad. Jesus. And uh Rudy is so impressed, it's like, Oh my god, my dad has always been this strong and it's like, No, his dad has not always been this strong. Dude's just straight flexing. <laughs> <laughs> I like that, like <laughs> when uh, he walks past, because he's the, <laughs> when Rudy's like, "You don't have to show off for me, Dad." <laughs> then he walks past Ellen Lee's, and she gives a little smirk, and you see his face, and he's like, <laughs> "No," he says, "Um, he says to like Paul, like, oh my God, I can't believe you're so strong." And then Paul's like, "What are you talking about?" And you should have seen me back in my prime, because you know he's an older <laughs> guy now. I think he's like in his forties yeah. or something. But yeah, he's like, he's all giddy because, you know, the, his magical son who's always known what to do and has all this magic compliments him. So, it's, you know, of course, any, yeah. any father would feel uh, happy that their son is proud of them, right? Yeah. So now I will say when when Rudy does rescue Roxy in the labyrinth, I, I again, I wish we got a little more of that context is that why she reacts the way she does, um, because without it, you're kind of left wondering, like, 
what in the world did happen to her. It's almost like she's a completely different person when she first sees him again. Yeah, she seems so, like, instead of being so stoic and uh, composed and stuff like that, she's, like, frantic, and she kind of gives up at the end there, and she's like, ah, I just want someone to save me. And then Rudy just fucking punches through the wall. So one thing that they... um. (laughs) <laughs> one thing that Rudy does is that the minute that he steps on the floor and he realizes that Rudy's there or uh, Roxy's there, mm. he says, fuck it. Fuck the cautionary tale about not using fire and mm. uh, collapsing walls. And he just punches straight through the walls yeah. to get to Roxy <laughs> to save her. <laughs> Did you also notice that uh, when Roxy is kind of like given up, like she sits down and she's like, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. She pisses herself. Yeah, of course she pisses herself. Wouldn't you piss yourself when you're surrounded by that many demons? I would. I mean, come on, I, I, let me be monsters. honest with you. I would have pissed myself way before that point. <laughs> yeah, so uh, saves Roxy, and it's like, oh, my God, my knight in shining armor. But not only that, it's like she's – this is her um, – <laughs> at first she doesn't realize it's Rudy because she hasn't seen him since he was, like, what, six or seven or something? Six or seven, little, something like that. Yeah, it's been, like, ten years since she's last seen him. Yeah. And it's like, he's grown into a, a man. He, he's a full-blown yeah. man. He's taller than her now and everything. And it's like her knight in shining armor. So she's like uh, infatuated with Rudy. Not only because it's like she she always liked him because it's like, oh, he's a smart kid. But he's also like, he saved her from dying. Yeah. I mean, I, she always kind of admired him as a student. But now she's like, oh, you're my knight in shining armor. I love No, him. no. Now he's, it was, he was a boy, but now he's a man. Yeah. <laughs> and it's so fucking funny when Paul realizes, like, oh, and then he's like, you know, Rudy, I used to like only having one sword, and it's really but great. But now I have two. <laughs> but now I have two. And, you know, these swords, they do different things. But at the end of the day, I love them both equally. <laughs> and I learned how to do that. And it's just like, Rudy's like, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> Paul just said, like, hmm, 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 hmm. <laughs> <laughs> fucking Paul. <laughs> Oh my god. Which is why I'm just like, dude, this is gonna be so shitty about what happens next. And I was like, and I I said this to a lot of people who were watching it. I was like, yeah, if it ends where I think it's gonna end, it's gonna be very bittersweet for a lot of people. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, you talked about this in our Discord server uh, for several weeks leading up to it. uh, Because you knew it was coming. No, I knew it was Uh, coming. I knew exactly what was gonna happen at the end. Well, I guess let let's get into it. So they get to the bottom of this, I guess bottom. Yeah, I get the bottom of the sanctum teleport dungeon. Yeah, of the they get to the boss dungeon. room. The, yeah, the they boss finally get room. to the boss room. Um, and what's standing between them and rescuing Zenith, who is trapped in this like crystal structure thing, um, is a hydra. And no, it's stuck inside of the hydra. The crystal is growing out oh, of the hydra. I thought it was actually in a wall behind the hydra. No, she's she's inside of the hydra. Okay. Well, then, anyway, she's stuck in a, she's stuck in a crystal structure attached to the hydra. Then, um, and that fight is really well animated. Oh yeah, it's uh, I mean, it's the most climactic fight, but it's yeah, it's a super fucked up fight because they go and attack the hydra, and they, as it turns out. The Hydra has anti-magic spells on it. You can't use mm-hmm. magic against it. It's got a shield. It's got a shield of, like, anti-magic. So if you try to attack it with any type of magic, even if it's like, oh, I, I created Earth to drop on it, the Earth would dissipate when it gets to the Hydra. But people can pass through that that shield easily. Yeah, but you have like, to get up close, and it's like, well, if I'm going to use magic, I can't be up close. Yeah. Um. So they fall back, and it's like, fuck, we... We, we got to regroup. Like, we can't fight this thing. And Paul finally sees, like, again, you got to understand that Paul has been missing his wife for, like, years now. And he's finally found found her. Like, she's there. Mm-hmm. And it's, like, realistically, Rudy's, like, I don't remember if it was Rudy or the party. They're, like, we don't even know if she's alive in there. Like, I've never heard of people being teleported inside of a crystal. Yeah. But he's, like, no, I know she's alive. I just know it. And it's just like, oh, shit. So then he's like, you all can leave, but I'm going to get her out of there. And it's like, as a party, they decide, like, are you fucking stupid? Like, of course, we'll fight together. So they, I like how um, the members of his party, I mean, the the, the dwarf guy, Talahan. Talahan, yeah. Talahan. And uh, I just like how he's such a uh, a bro. <laughs> 
I feel like that's probably something that was also missing from the anime adaptation. We probably get to know him a little better in the novel, I'm assuming. Uh, Well, the only thing that you learn about Talahan is that he's gay and he likes younger men. Because oh. when, oh. uh, when Rudy first meets him, he's like, he gets a shiver down his spine. And you do mm-hmm. kind of see it when he meets Talahan again, where Talahan looks like the, sh- the next shot after Talahan is that he looks down and he stares at Rudy's like butt. Mm. So it's like that was the nod to the novel of like, hey, remember this from the original? Like, dude's gay. That, yeah. But they obviously did, decided not to show that because, you know, it's 2024. So <laughs> they didn't, um, it's, it's kind of like a throwaway joke anyway. So it's like it, it's not important to the plot whatsoever. Fair enough. And you got Geese who always seems to be pretty ride or die with Paul. <laughs> well, he's just a funny like thief guy. Yeah. yeah, they devise this plan uh, where they're like, okay, well, magic doesn't work, but um, – and then he <laughs> – Rudy thinks up the plan of like, well, in the story of Hercules, um, he defeats the Hydra by cauterizing or using fire to like cauterize the wound so that way it can't regrow its head. So that's how we're going to kill it. And they come up with this crazy plan. It's like, okay, Paul's going to be the frontliner. Rudy and Roxy will handle the burning of the appendages. Uh, Elianis El- – Elian – Alina Louise will Elena back up Lise Paul. Will back up Paul and kind of be the um, all arounder. Talahan will also be like the defender of the mages and all arounder. So it's like they come up with this plan and it starts working and stuff like that. And then until the the Hydra realizes their fucking plan and is like, oh, then I'll just bite off my own necks where you cauterize my wounds to regrow my heads. Mm-hmm. It's a it's a good thing that that Hydra works the same way the Hydra works in the Greek legend. <laughs> And, um, yeah, it leads up to the final, like, conclusion of the fight where uh, Rudy is about to get fucking killed because he he froze for, like, half a second. And half a second yeah. in a dungeon is life or death. So he gets saved by his dad, by put, his dad pushing him out of the way. Yeah, pushing him, like, way out of the way of the, the Hydra that's coming down. Or the, the last yeah. head. The last head of the Hydra. And then, um... um do you want to say it or do I want to say it? <laughs> well, then, you know, Paul gets bitten, so then Rudy gets pissed off, and then he, like, fucking Falcon punches the the Hydra into the eye. Mm-hmm. Like, he just he just goes, he doesn't think anymore. He just, like, goes savage to finally beat the Hydra. And they do finally beat the Hydra, and, like, they're all like, oh, my God, we did it. We, we fucking beat the boss. And then when he looks for his dad, it's like, oh, shit, his dad's dead. And I just want to point out, so when this won't mean anything to people who are watching this after the fact, but when this originally broadcasted, this episode where Rudy's father dies aired on Father's Day. (laughs) (laughs) Jesus. Now, John and I have talked about this, and I agree with him. I don't think this was intentional. It is just a very tragic coincidence that Paul dies on Father's Day. (laughs) Yeah, and... It's so sad because it's like Paul. I mean, he was throwing up so many fucking red flags. Like I was like, dude, you're, and and, and then he even mentions it. Uh, Rudy mentions it like, oh, Paul, don't say that. You're gonna throw up a bunch of flags. And it's like, oh, oh, Rudy, <laughs> if you only knew how right you were and didn't think this was just an offhand comment to make about like. And, and funny. you know, you know what's funny is that having watched Mishoku Tensei so far, I could I could have imagined that they were throwing all that up as like a distraction. It's like the false red flags, right? Yeah, and it's even worse because it's like, unlike most death scenes in anime where it's like, oh, the person who's dying will at least impart like some last some words, some wisdom or like last words, like, hey, kid, you'll make it out of here. I believe Or just you. say, I love you before they die. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, with Paul, nope, he literally just dies. Well, That's it. I, I will say, I thought they were going to go for that because you can see his eyes are still kind of moving a little bit. So he's still like... Alive, you got bitten half, bro. <laughs> but no, his eyes are moving and his mouth moves, and it looks like he's about to say something. But then he just like dies. And I'm like, oh my god, thank you for not like going into that trope of like this mortally wounded person being able to speak coherent sentences. Yeah, because he got bitten half by the Hydra. <laughs> Did you guys forget about that? And then thrown against a yeah. wall. Yeah, Dude's I. It, it's a. It's it's kind of brutal. Like especially when when Rudy realizes what's what's happened. Um. Like he's, they they were able to free his mom from the crystal finally, um, but at the expense of his father's life. 
And like the crazy thing is like right after this, as they're walking back through the labyrinth and back into the city, you know, in any other isekai, especially one where you just defeated a big bad, not maybe the big bad, but a big bad, uh, this would be like a big moment of celebration. There'd be a lot of happy people. No one is happy. Absolutely. No one in that party is happy. Yeah. Because after he saves his mom, his dad dies and, when they, um, you know, the the last sparkling hope was just like when his mom, like Zenith, actually she is alive and she wakes up, but now she's like a vegetable. She can't she's speak. She's got severe brain damage. Yeah, and it's just like, what was this all for? Like, yeah, you you saved your mom, but she's not there anymore, and now your dad is dead. So it's yeah. like that's why I was like, dude, everyone's gonna hate the the ending to the season. They're so, gonna be so fucked really? up over it. <laughs> In, in a way, since it it seems maybe there'll be some magic that'll heal her sometime down the road, but just judging it for what I see right now, Rudy has had to watch two of his parents die. One of them is just still alive, but the actual person she was isn't there anymore. Yeah, and this causes Rudy to spiral into a, a big depression again, and it's just like he doesn't he doesn't know what to do and he doesn't want to do anything because it's like fuck I failed like I I, th despite how powerful I am in this new world despite how I said I was going to uh, save my mom like I didn't save anyone mm -hmm. I lost yeah, my, um, my mom isn't being like sure we saved her body but she's not there she can't do anything and I lost yeah. my dad and it's all his fault yeah. because he froze up for that half a second it's all his fault I mean, his dad died the yeah, th his mom would have probably been the same either way, but at least if he hadn't have froze up, then he wouldn't have lost his dad. Um, but something that the anime adaptation didn't do as good of a job as the the light novel adaptation did, and you pointed this out to me, um, is that it doesn't seem like that much time passes between them getting back to like the city at the end of the, defeating the Hydra and them like going off back home right but yeah there's like what a three-week period there uh i don't know how much time passes but it is a while uh, the anime makes they... it seem like it's like a day or two later and it's yeah. not it seems because like at the point when we see roxy and rudy at that first episode uh or the next episode together in the first scene yeah it's been weeks at that point that yeah. Rudy's kind of just been locked in his in. He doesn't want to eat, and he's kind of like skin and bones at this point because he's like he's mega depressed because yeah. he he wasn't able to accomplish anything. He's in a Not, depressive spiral. Yeah, and then we get to uh, Roxy wanting to sleep with Rudy to like get him out of his depression. Can we talk about this? Because you and, said that there was a lot of stuff left out from this. So that's another thing that they cut out. So Roxy wants to do something for Rudy, but she doesn't know what because she's kind of bad at communication, you know, as seen as prior in the thing where she comes from a village of people who uses ESP or can uh, communicate telepathically, but she can't and yeah. doesn't know how to communicate with people because of that, right? Mm -hmm. So she wants to do something for Rudy, but she doesn't know what. And it's actually Talahand and um, Sylvie's grandma that are like, well, we see, we've seen how you've been acting around Rudy. Like you clearly like him. And we think it would be good if you could, like, sleep with him or something to help him get him out of the depressive state. Because one thing that will help snap him out of it is to, like, come back to reality of, like, you know, there's people here who still care about you. So Come, come back to reality. Nice pun. Yeah. So they completely skip that. And it kind of seems like, oh. She's a homewrecker. <laughs> she's a homewrecker. She kind of just sleeps with him. And it's been one-sided this entire time. And it's like, well... He's always revered Roxy, like, you know, his 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 religious relic, if everyone yeah. remembers what that is. Um, <laughs> he has many religious relics, by the way. Yeah. This just uh, was his first religious relic. Yes. Um, I mean, even Roxy herself, and maybe this is expand, expanded upon in the in the source material. Uh, even Roxy herself, after the fact, says, yeah, it was it was kind of uh, selfish or. I forget what the word she uses is, um, but kind of like uh, she had an ulterior motive, I think is the phrase that she uses in, in, in doing so. And yeah. Just, so the phrasing he, of that is really bad. <laughs> well, so 
after they sleep together, uh, Rudy realizes like he gets snapped out of it, and he's like, "Oh my god, I finally I, I slept with uh, Master Roxy," mm-hmm. and he gets out of his depress- depressive slump. And is like, "I still need to make the journey home. I need to get my mom home at least for them for my family to see her." And during this journey back, they they kind of like it's kind of like a fling. And mm. Rudy's kind of in an internal struggle where it's like, I, you know, I promised to be with Sylvie only. Uh, I was faithful, <laughs> promised to be faithful. And I ended up not being faithful. And it's like, he wants to take responsibility for all of this and he doesn't know what to do. Mm. So that's when, um, they do show that Sophie's grandma at least is like, gives him advice. Like, you know, your dad did have two wives. You're not a follower of, um, Millis Millilith. Mi- something Mil- <laughs> whatever Millis, religion Millis. is Millis whatever religion that uh his mom is part of uh which yeah. they are monogamous they despise people taking um multiple wives multiple wives yeah they they hate polygamy so he she's like well as long as you and Sophie aren't part of that religion like there's no reason you can't have a second wife so it's just Rudy feeling fucked up about it Because it's like, he does love uh, Roxy, but he loves her in a different way than he loves Sophie. Like, he loves Sophie because she's a childhood friend and she helped him, you know, cure his ED and stuff like that. But he loves Roxy. It's kind of almost like a, she's the one who helped him become the master magician that he is. She's the one who helped him get over his extreme fear of leaving his house. She is like, she's, it's a different style or type of love for him. Like, the type of love that he feels for them is equally as strong and he doesn't know how but to cope it's a with different that. type of love but yeah. just both both are as equally strong so they eventually make it home and you know rudy's like you know this story's got to end like i'm so sorry i didn't you know i didn't want to lead you on or anything like that and then roxy again is cool with it and she's just like you know i i knew that you had a home life i know and i know all this stuff but i i just wanted to live the dream for however long it would be anyway so it's fucking sad. It sucks. And it's like, well, Roxy, what do you want? And then it's like, she's like, I, w- I want to be with you regardless of anything. So he's like, all right, bet. I'm going to go kowtow to my wife and <laughs> beg for her forgiveness. And we'll see if we can make anything happen. Mm-hmm. So he finally, when, but then he, um, when he's come, going back and they get back to the town, he realizes like, wait, the man God said I would have a bigger regret if I went to the labyrinth city and helped my dad, but what Mm -hmm. I felt about my dad dying and what happened to my mom isn't regret. It's grief. Like, Holy fuck. What happened to my family? (laughs) So he's running into the house and it's like, it's empty. He's like, no one's there. Bro, when that that happened, when that happened and he he walks into an empty house, I'm like, Oh God, he's going to find Sylphie like murdered on the bed or some shit. And I'm like, please don't do this to me. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Cause it's like, Oh God, what could be worse than like his dad dying and his uh, mom being a vegetable. And he goes around. He's like, there's no one there. It's all empty. All the lights are off. And he's like, what the fuck? What the fuck? And all I can think about is like, Bro, you returned at the middle of the day. Like everyone's busy, they're doing shit. But uh, of course, because I knew the ending, I, I was like, "Yeah, no, nothing happened." So uh, he finds Aisha, and he's like, "Oh my god, Aisha, you're okay? Nothing bad happened? Like, where's Norn? Where's Sophie? Where's Norn?" And it's like, "Norn's at school, and Sophie's doing some shopping or something or whatever. She was doing. No, I think something. she said like laying down or something. I don't remember. I don't remember. She was doing something, and it's like, yeah, everyone's fine. Like everyone, there's nothing that went wrong at all." So then he finally sees Sylphie and it's like, it's been about like six months at this point, like six or seven Bro, months. And when they, they pan up, not, not only would they pan up and they show her pregnant belly, she's about what, six months pregnant more or less? Six or seven six, months, seven yeah, months. something like that. And then they show her with the longer hair. I'm like, oh! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, long hair with Sylphie's. Oh. Mm. Mm. Anyway, she's the best girl now in my mind. <laughs> she's always been best girl. But uh, the reason I said she's best girl is not only because she cures our boy of ED. Uh, after he kowtows and like apologizes to Sophie, he's like, "I I know I told you I'd be faithful and I'd do all this for you, but you know I I slept with Roxy, but she helped save me from this massive depression after our, my dad died." And Sophie is like, she's not mad or anything. She's like, you know what? I mean, I knew you were mega perverted, so I expected something like this to happen anyway, and it's fine. I I, I accept Roxy as your second wife. And I'm just like, this is why she was best girl. Ha, 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 ha. 
uh, of like what a I, goddess. Can I say something? <laughs> But before that whole scene happens, we also get the scene where everyone is gathered, like in that living room area of of their home. Like not only uh, Sylphie and Rudy and the the sisters, but like everyone from Paul's party. That yeah, they're waiting the for Norm back. to come home. Yeah, and when they have that talk with the girls about Paul's Paul dying, and they see their mother is a vegetable, or uh, well, one of their mothers is a vegetable. Uh, they react like kids should when they get that kind of news. <laughs> it's like, p- thank you for that. And not just having them be stoic and like be, well, it is what it is. It's like, no, yeah, like children Norn would react. Like- it would react with uh, immense grief learning. Yeah. This. Like Aisha is so happy to see her mom, but it's like, she, she doesn't want to be like, Oh, I'm so happy about seeing my mom. Cause it's like, well, my dad is dead. And, Norn's mom is a vegetable, and it's like, oh, and, well, and Norn be is up. like, un. She's like, oh man, Ooh, Norn does not take it very well at the beginning. Yeah, because like the only the you know to her, her only family was her dad for a long time. Because it's like this is Aisha's mom. She's not my mom, and my mom has been missing for however yeah. long. Because I believe the teleportation event happens when they're like young, like four or five or something. Young, yeah, Rudy's very I young. Think, Seven when it happens, six. I think he's he was ten or something when I it happened. Yeah, but it's been years. Yeah, it's been years. It's been a long time. But um, yeah, with everything that's happened, like Norn, she tries to blame Rudy, but then she sees like he lost his fucking hand. Yeah, <laughs> but it's like even he, the greatest, like strongest magician, wasn't able to escape from this battle unscathed. And I like so, how I like how they let Norn like just no one tries to interrupt her, right? They let her have her little I, I don't want to call it a tantrum, but I think you know what I mean. Um uh, and like express her grief and no one in no one in that room interrupts her, they just let her have it. And then once Norn has like gotten through uh like the initial like crying and, and wailing, she turns to Aisha and realizes that she's like being super stoic about it and she's like you know, you don't have to do this for my sake. And then Aisha just goes over and like holds her mom and just cries in, into her shirt. Yeah, because she's so happy to see her mom. Oh, uh, that scene was so good. There's a lot of this of good voice acting in that scene from the two voice actresses who are uh, portraying the sisters. And then like the next part is like fucking terrible because so that Rudy has like, all right, I need to say something else to the to the family. Mm-hmm. Um. And it's like, I, I want to welcome Roxy as my second wife. Like, I cheated on you, Sylvie. I'm sorry, and this and that. And Sylvie's not kind of not reacting to it at all. Aisha's kind of just like, oh, like, oh, well, I mean, he's the master of the house. He does what he wants. And she's kind of always like, been like, this is above my pay grade. I'm not saying a thing. And then, then there's Norn, who's like super pissed off about it. Because mm. she's like, I can't fucking believe you. And then it, it's part of like, you know, so you're telling me, um, you know, it was so treacherous that you wouldn't, you weren't able to save dad, but you had enough time to feel fool around with another woman. You know, it's like, do you know how sick and uh, worried, worried sick uh, Sylvie was waiting for you, this and that? And it's just like, yeah, Norn is pissed off. Not only because of that, but she, like her mother, was raised in that um, monogamous religion. Yeah. So prior to the children being with uh, Rudy, they Paul actually went and visited um, Zenith's family, who live on that continent of Mill- Millicent or whatever whatever continent it was, um, and stayed with her parents, who are mega religious. So oh. that's kind of where Norn gets her like bias towards the mm-hmm. po- um, polygamy aspect. Yeah. Completely forgetting that she has a half sister right there with right her next mom, to her right there and it's like you know your dad practiced polygamy right the guy yeah. that you sell you so love i like how in this like tirade that she goes on not only is she like um just like just shitting all over rudy for sleeping with roxy while he was away it's like not only did you sleep with someone you slept with this one and it looks like a child and yeah like, like how old are you my Ro- age she's like, you, you know, she can't be much older than me and roxy's like you know despite how short i am i am a grown woman <laughs> yeah she's like 20 something or 30 something i think she's like 26 i think she's older, I think like she's older than that i i don't remember 
I have no I have idea. To look it up, but um, yeah, she's uh, she's an adult. Yeah, <laughs> by all for all intents and purposes, she is an adult. And after uh, Norn gives her spiel about this and stuff like that, Sylphie is just like cool with it. She's like, you know, um, I see that you love Rudy just as much as I love Rudy, so it's fine. And I'm just mm-hmm. like, Sylphie, best girl, Sylphie, best wife. <laughs> Roxy is somewhere between forty and sixty years old. Yeah, she old. Uh, yeah, it says, well, it says between volume one and 23. I, I'm assuming this falls in that range. Uh, yeah, she's probably like 50 at this point in time then. Cause if yeah. she meets Rudy when she's like 40, then she must be like 50. Yeah. That makes it, that makes sense. Uh, but yeah, I, I just, man, there was some, when the, these last two episodes, when they get back, um, to uh or the last episode i guess when they get back to the house there's some really great voice acting being on on display here um especially from the two sisters um i like how chinoda even though he's not here put a note in our show notes doc threesome scene win (laughs) thank you chinoda for that insightful note um probably never although who knows um and I, I know. So, I, I'm sure you know. <laughs> I know the know. answer to this question. <laughs> I'm sure you know. Uh, but, uh, and then after we have this, um, uh, Sylphie does, in fact, uh, welcome Roxy into the household as a second wife. Um, Roxy says that she doesn't want to get, like, officially married um, until after Sylphie has her baby, um, which we get to see. Uh Baby looks cute. Looks really cute. It's a cute yeah. baby. He has a daughter. He's a father now. He's a father. Uh, I I like how Sylvie's first reaction is, uh, oh, thank God it doesn't have green hair. <laughs> yeah, because, you know, when she was a kid and she had green hair, it's um, reminiscent of the um, Supard race from the Demon mm. Continent, which are this, like, war-mongering um, psycho killer tribe of people. So... That's yeah. why everyone doesn't like gr- the green hair. But even though it's just like, yeah. it was just a genetic thing. Like, it's not even the green that the Supard green is. It's just similar to like, it, it is a green, but not the same shade. It, it's similar enough to where people don't really care to know they the They think difference. it's like bad, it, it's um, bad luck. Just like back in the day yeah. when they thought, um, oh my God, who are the albinos? They thought albinos oh. were bad luck. Um, yeah, we get, we get some nice, some nice wrap up uh, to that. Um, and it seems like Rudy's life, I mean, you know, obviously notwithstanding what happened to his parents is sort of getting back to normal more or less, um, after they get back and then they have that scene, right? The, the last scene of the, the, the season where Rudy goes to Paul's grave and they have that, well, they, uh, Rudy has that sort of monologue with himself about, um, like growth and wanting to be better. Yeah. Man, Cause now he has, cool. now he's a father. So it's like, and this plays into like the rest of the uh, story. Cause he, he takes it very seriously. Like, Oh, I have a kid now. Mm-hmm. That scene though, man, who there's some good shit in that. <laughs> there's some good shit in that monologue. <laughs> yeah. like <laughs> Oh, such a, it's a good adaptation. I, I really it it, have been enjoying Mushoku Tensei, even though they leave out a bunch of stuff where I'm like, God damn it. It would have made, it would have been even more impactful if you kept it in. I don't understand why you just didn't make time for it. Fuck the ED, fuck the OP. That's an extra three <laughs> minutes we can shave off and add extra story. <laughs> <laughs> just take, take the, uh, the re-zero route. Just don't have any OPs and EDs. <laughs> exactly. Just fill your entire, from first second to last second of the series just only show story <laughs> exactly just, just take the time we don't need the ops we don't need the eds uh but yeah I, I love that final scene um so much uh we get a lot of uh little uh flashes of a lot of the the minor side characters even get a flash of eris for a very short amount of time um which eris was brought up when uh Roger returned um which we didn't really talk about but um I have a feeling she's eventually going to come back into the story somehow. I don't know exactly how. Um, I know how. <laughs> I know you know how. You don't have to keep saying you know you know. Uh, 
but yeah, that's that's pretty much how uh, this season ends. And then when we get the fade out, there is a little title card that says the third season is in production. Yeah, which gives me a lot of hope for like, if they do four seasons, they should be able to adapt everything. Now they will have to yada yada over a bunch of stuff if they do it in four seasons. Mm-hmm. Um, I would prefer if they did five, but with given the, how they did the pacing in season two, four seasons I, in a movie. <laughs> Yeah, four seasons in a movie. That would actually be pretty awesome if they did the last one. Well, I mean, the last volume is a epilogue volume, so it's mm. not like it, I'm pretty sure that's not going to get adapted. It might come out as an OVA series or something later on. So mm. there's going to be like 25 volumes, I think, 24 volumes total. Mm. Okay. And we have done up to 12 so far, which is why like, I'm like, yeah, they're going to have to condense at least one of the volumes but yeah other than that um but you're still yeah, you're they, still hard, you're still dead set on four seasons at 24 episodes a season yeah if they keep the same pacing then they just have to condense one extra volume and there's a bunch of areas where i know they can shave that down cuz it's like okay. it's not very important to the story at all just like some world building character building stuff they could keep out yeah cuz they skipped okay. a bunch of stuff anyway like think again it, there's a lot of areas where they can just take out things that it makes the overall experience of the story way better for sure. Mm-hmm. However, it's not integral to the main story, which gotcha. I will say we will get into in season three. Finally, we'll get into the nice. ma- Like you thought, you thought this was the story. Like, no, there is an actual end game at play here and we're going to get into it in season three. So I'm, I'm pretty excited for it. Cause now I'm like, yes, we can learn about the end game. <laughs> nice. Nice. I, I'm, I'm hyped for it as well. Um, I don't there was no like timeline for when the third season is going to come out. I have to imagine they're probably going to do a split core like they've done for the first two. Um, um if I I saw somewhere had... someone said what? summer 2025. Ooh, I don't know if it'll be that soon. If I had to guess, I would say either fall 2025 or winter 2026. I swear it's at summer 2025. <laughs> But that might it have been for it, Windbreaker, actually. I don't remember. <laughs> I remember reading a YouTube, or not YouTube, a Crunchyroll comment on some anime I was watching that was like, yeah, it's going to be. I'm pretty sure be... it's Windbreaker because they. I, I think I remember them saying that was going to be summer 2025. No, I, it might have been Windbreaker. I, I as, don't remember. As far as I know, at least as of the time of this recording, no definitive like uh, release date for the third season has come out yet. Um, if I had to guess, I would say either fall 25 or winter 26. Um, and I do think they'll probably do a split core again with at least one or two seasons in between each core. I'm fine um, with that. I mean, I, yeah, I'm fine I, with I would that, prefer if, if it was this... one long core, but like whatever. I mean, <laughs> hey, if we get the same like animation and, 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 and stuff, if we get the same quality, I'm fine with waiting. Because I want them to make this look and feel as good as it can for the adaptation. Right. And I'm willing to wait for that quality. Uh, to wrap this up, though, uh, you want to talk about our scores for this uh, this half season. And maybe the second season overall. So, for this part two of the second season, I, I'm scoring it an 8 out of 10. Um, I thought it was a great adaptation. Um, mm-hmm. But in terms of like how they did the story i i just felt like they left out too much there's too many mm. things that felt like it was rushed like the whole roxy sleeping with um rudy scene like literally it just happens like within the first yeah. five minutes and it's just like yeah. where did this come from what like what the fuck like i get that he needs to snap out of his depression but there was like no build up for that um and i like i said that to me it was they they really fumbled the ball at the end uh because they there was plenty of stuff they could have just cut out from the beginning yeah, or they could have just had one additional episode instead of making it a twenty-four episode season, make it a twenty-five episode season. Yeah, I, I feel like they didn't build up the relationship between Roxy and Rudy before this happened. Yeah, uh, I, yeah, I agree, um, and I definitely agree that there's. It seems even as an anime only watcher of Mashoku Tensei, it seems like there's some stuff, especially in this half season, that was yada yada over from the source material, which is a shame. Um, but I still give it a nine out of 10, man. I enjoyed the hell out of this. I love the character building. I love watching Rudy grow. I love the world building that we got. Um, not only in this half season, but in the second season overall, um, I just, 
I can't I can't I can't give anything lower than a nine. Easy nine out of ten for me. All right. Um, and Chinota guess, also scored it an eight out of ten. Yeah. We don't know why. <laughs> Just, I don't I don't know why. Um, um I do know that if Natai were here, I would be f- laughing because he made a bet with his friend that Rudy is not gonna have um more than one girl. And again, I knew I was like, oh, you poor, poor sucker. You lost this bet. You lost your $100, Dead. bro. Man, that money is <laughs> gone. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, he lost that bet. R.I.P. Natai, you lost Listen, the bet. I have, learned, I have learned over the years the only thing that you should bet with John on is sports because he always loses. <laughs> my team's always lose you and i have you and i have bet actual money on three different sporting events and you've lost every single time it's the way it goes man it's the way it goes <laughs> don't put money on the on seattle teams just don't do it man <laughs> one day seattle will rise again <laughs> But yeah, that's it. Um, that is the second half or the second core of Mashoku Tensei's second season. I, for one, as I'm sure many others, are looking forward to uh, the third season. Um, and I am sure we will do another spoiler cast when that comes around. Uh, John, you got any closing thoughts uh, before I wrap this up? No. Uh, other than the fact that I told you all, Sophie, best girl. No one <laughs> knew why. Now you know why. <laughs> Yeah, um, I it took mean, two to seasons fair, to get there, but now you understand my point of view. Why Sophie is best girl? To be fair, I don't think I ever actually declared any of the girls a best girl until now. I just said I, that Roxy could be best girl. I have declared it with my heart. Sophie, best girl. Yes. She look, All right. She she ride or die. Okay. She listen. If Rudy ever fumbles this bag, like this man's, like I swear to God. If you listen, have a girl, I think if you if anyone if anyone, if anyone, anyone ever finds a girl that loyal and you fumble it, just 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 don't ever talk to women ever again. <laughs> just just like go sewer slide or something, man. Like and man, you just ah, just, ah. just take a lot of cold showers after that because you're gonna need it. <laughs> you're you're gonna need it. Uh, all that being said, thank you everyone for dropping in to watch us talk about uh, this. Please do not forget to like, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff. If you like what you saw, if you want to see more, do tell us what your favorite uh, part of this season was down below. You can also check down below where you can find links to all the stuff Anime Club After Dark does. We also have a merch store where you can buy Anime Club After Dark merchandise if you'd like to help us out that way. With all that being said, I have been your host, Alex, and we will see you next time. Say goodnight, John. Good night. Bye. Man, I. Eloise is this kind of hot. Oh she a gilf. She a gilf. <laughs> she a gilf. I mean, you right though, but never marry. <laughs> Listen, never marry I'm the not stripper. talking. About, I'm not talking about marrying her. I'm just saying she's hot. She's easy on the eyes. <laughs> she's easy in a lot of ways. Yeah, she's very easy in other ways. You're right.